started right now. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to kind of pick up the pace of this class. You know, I know, you know, the the previous, you know, nine weeks or so, you know, sounds like it's really fast, but we are actually going to pick up the pace. You know, the it's going to it's going to be a little bit quicker uh, now, um, but the topic is different too. Um, it's more about programming now than you know the earlier part of this class, which is more about you know, what is inside the processor. So today's focus is already in the announcement. You know, I send the announcement you know, uh, both to you guys so that you know what we'll be talking about today, but also as a self reminder so that I remember you know, what topics you know, that I need to go over today. So the announcement for today mentions that we are going to talk about three different type, uh, three different, three different instructions. Um, two of those are in the same category because they belong to the jump, you know, family of instructions, and then the other one actually belongs to a family that we have talked about already, because compare is almost the same as a subtraction, except the result is not stored. That's the only difference between a compare, which is a subtraction but the difference is not stored back to a register, okay? So we'll start with, uh, we'll start with compare, okay? Just because it's an easier uh, opcode to talk about. So we go to the opcode table and then we look at the register transfer description of the compare versus the subtract instruction. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. So right here, you can see this is the subtract instruction. And then we have the compare instruction, I think, down or up somewhere. Where is it? CMP is right here. There we go. So I'm just you know, selecting both of those rows so it is both uh, visible on the screen. So you can see the subtract instruction is, des is described as register X gets register X minus register Y. <clears throat> register X is you know these two bits here, you know, the XX you know, specify register X, and these two bits over here, YY specifies register Y. So we basically subtract register Y from register X and then store the result back into register X. That's the whole idea of the subtract instruction. The compare instruction, which is on row 30, is almost exactly the same thing. You can see that we are still subtracting you know, register Y from register X, except the result is not stored. So it goes through the whole motion of finding the difference, but the difference itself is not stored. So you ask, what is the whole purpose of that instruction then? Well, it will still change all the flags that we have been talking about since uh, we talked about the signed versus unsigned um, representation. And also, when we talked about binary comparison, you know that is so. That's why the important that's the importance of that particular discussion is you know all those flags are now coming back to help us with the next topic that we'll be talking about. Okay, so that's the first. The, the first thing we'll do is to just kind of play with the compare instruction and then take a look at the ALU and also how the flags are going to be computed. So this is going back to the topic of binary comparison, okay? So it might be helpful for you to review the binary comparison module, you know, not during class, but after class, okay? Because I think that's gonna be quite useful. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and uh, do the same thing, the usual thing that we do, which is, you know, start up Logisim and then load the processor in. Okay, so open recent the processor but this time we're gonna write some instructions you know, to exercise the subtract instruction. And just like in the previous class, I'm going to hand assemble the actual opcode for you know, the comparison. So I'll let you guys decide you know, which two regi different registers do you want me to compare. So you guys can say, you know, I want to compare register A versus register C versus the, you know, register B versus register D, whatever. So what do you want to pick as register X? It's up to you. Yep. Hmm? A and D. Okay, very good. So that's what we'll do. Okay, so we'll go to, I mean, open up a mouse pad. It's just a text editor. Yeah, just some place that I can easily 
document you know what we are talking about here so we want to do a CMP a D is that correct register a versus register D so we want to do the hand and sub hand assembly and what we do is we take a look at the opcode table this is the entry corresponding to the compare instruction so we have a fixed bit pattern of 1110 which is a E in hexadecimal followed by XX, which in this case is register A, which is 00, zero. and then register Y is register D, which is represented by the bit pattern of 1-1. One, one. So this becomes the binary bit pattern of the opcode. Do we have any questions about the hand assembling process, which is basically looking at the mnemonic, and then go through the opcode table, look at the pattern, and then come up with the actual bit pattern for the opcode itself, the opcode is what we want to put into RAM, you know, because you know, that's where the processor is going to get the opcode from, and then decode it, and then you know execute it. So, do we have any questions about your know, why CMP AD or compare register A to register D has an opcode of basically E3 in this case, because 1110 is in hexadecimal E, and 0011 is hexadecimal 3. So are we good with that process so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> and that's all we're going to do this time. Okay, so we'll follow that with a halt instruction. And the halt instruction always has a bit pattern of 0000, 0001, okay, which is not super important to us at this point because I'm not going to single step through the halt instruction. We'll just kind of get to the compare instruction and then let go, and then just kind of stay there for a little bit. All right. So we're gonna go, you know, try this out, okay? We go to the uh, Logisim, and then we go to the RAM component here, and I'm just gonna put in, you know, the bit pattern of E3, which is, you know, comparing register A to register B, and then go to the next location and put in our halt instructions like that. So for really short programs, you know, just to experiment with a few things, you can always just, you know, kind of program in the memory content without going through the assembler. Now, if you're saying, Attack, you know, how do we know that you actually hand assembled the instructions correctly? Then you go to the, the assembler, okay, right here, and then we go to the source, and then we erase this whole thing here, which is not what our focus is today, um, and then we just, you know, say compare A to D, and then the halt instruction, and then we go to the RAM file, you know, which is the quickest and easiest way to figure out, you know, what should be the content in RAM, so it agrees that you know, the first byte should be an E3 at location 00, zero and then the second byte should be a zero, 01 at location zero, 01 as well. Do we have any questions at this point you know, before we actually proceed to play with the CMP instruction? Okay, I do not see any questions. Now, when I ask you, do you have a question, you do not always have to respond with a particular question. If you need more time to think about you know, how to ask a question, you can always you know, just raise your hand and let me know that, okay, I need more time to think about how to ask that question. That is perfectly okay as well. Okay, I just want to make sure that we understand that. So are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> So we move on, and then we go here. Now, when you look at register A versus, reg versus register D, it's not going to be very exciting right now because they're both just 0, 0. Okay, so comparing 0, 0 to 0, 0 is not a whole lot of fun. I mean, it is kind of interesting because we have a Z flag that will be set because of this, okay? But, you know, I think it's more fun to kind of set these you know, two registers to have different values. So we're going to go with uh, register A being 00, zero and then register D being, say, FF, okay? The reason why I picked these two particular values is 00, zero is always just representing the value of 0, okay? That part is pretty clear. But FF, depending on whether it is a signed integer versus an unsigned integer, it can represent two different values. So I hope you still remember the signed versus unsigned you know, discussion, because that's coming back now, okay? Because, you know, FF as a signed integer is representing negative 1. How do we know? Because it is negative 128 
plus 1, plus 2, plus 4, plus 8, plus 16, plus 32, plus 64. That adds up to negative 1. That is the whole thing about the VS, you know, representation, the signed value representation of the bit pattern. On the other hand, as an unsigned integer, FF is representing 255 because we are adding 128 to 64 to 32 to 16 to 8 to 4 to 2 to 1. Okay, that adds up to 255. So are we okay with that discussion? That is nothing new, okay? It all has to do with signed versus unsigned interpretation of a bit pattern, which is also known as the VS equation versus the VU equation. That was in uh, exam one. So, you know, I'm hoping that that is still relatively fresh on your mind. Are we good so far? Yes? I sure hope so, okay? So this is where you know, I can emphasize you know, the importance of reviewing past concepts because you know, this class you know, kind of stack on top of your previous concepts. New concepts stack on top of previous concepts. So that's why it is kind of important to make sure that we understand all the previous concepts well enough so that we can you know, build, it up, build the new concepts upon the older concepts. All right. <clears throat> So what we're doing now is to go to the um, bottom part here, which is called the controller of the processor. And I'm going to go you know, fast forward all the way to the decode cycle. So that means you know, um, four clicks okay, or four control Ts, because you know, the first three control Ts will correspond to the fetch phase of executing an instruction. The fourth one, which is falling edge, is corresponding to the decode phase of executing an instruction. I'm not going to get into the details of how those you know, phases work or to, or, to, or to explain that. If you want a review of those particular discussions and the explanation, that would be last Thursday's lecture. Okay, so it's, a, it's one week ago that we started to talk about those phases of executing an instruction. All right, so control T four times. One, two, three, four. There we go. So you can see how the microcode pointer is now E30, which is the opcode, with an extra zero on the right hand side. Okay, that's what the decode is going to do. The content at location E30 in the ROM is now sending all 26 bits, 25 actually, to the rest of the processor so that we can now try to analyze what is going on with the processor what is being changed, what is doing what, and so on. So now we go back up to the uh, main part of the processor, and then we do the usual analysis of what is being used, and then from that we ask, addi we ask additional questions. We look at RAM first, you know, because that's the usual thing that I go to, is the RAM, and you can see the RAM is, is it being used? No, because the select is a zero, it's a dark green, so we don't have to ask all those other questions anymore. Are we reading, are we writing, who is driving the A port, who is you know, using the B port? All of those questions are now irrelevant because RAM is not being used. Okay, so if it's not being used, what is being used right now? <clears throat> um, we can see that you know, RIEN is also dark green, which means you know, we are not updating any registers. Okay, so no register in the register bank is being updated. You go like, um, let's look at the program counter. The program counter is also not getting updated because the enable of the program counter is also dark green, which means it's not getting updated. So it looks like not a whole lot is getting updated. Wait, hold on a second here. Look at this flags register. It does have the EM being light green, so that means the flag register is going to be updated in the upcoming rising edge. Is that okay? So this is the first time, this is the first time that we see that the flag register is going to be updated. When we talked about the um, <clears throat> bitwise not you know, instruction, the flag register was actually updated in that case as well, but it wasn't as important as the discussion today. So that's why I never talked about it in the previous lecture when we talked about the not instruction. So now we look at the flag here register. Now that we know the flag register, 
flags register is going to be updated, what do you think is the next question to ask? So this is me trying to train you to come up with follow-up questions as soon as you know one thing. It's like, oh, so if this is happening, I really need to ask that second question. So what would be the second question that you should be asking right now? We know the flags register is going to be updated, so what is the next question to ask? It's like me telling you to write something on your notebook right now. What do you think you're going to ask next? What do you want me to write on my notebook, right? You know, the fact that I want you to do something, then the next question is, um, so what is going to be used to update the flags register? Okay, so this is the kind of thinking that I would call is a dependency kind of thinking. Because, you know, to update a register, it depends on who is feeding the D port. So that dependency is going to help prompt you, you know, with that question of, okay, now that we know the flags register is getting updated, who is supplying the value to update the flags register? So in the processor, you know, given the processor is open to you and you can bring this to the second exam and all that stuff, what are you going to do to track down how the flags register is going to be updated? Which port of the flags register are you going to follow? Every register has a bunch of ports, right? It has D, it has Q, it has EN, it has the clock, it also has the clear ports. All of those are ports of a register, but when I ask the question how a register is going to be updated, which port are you going to follow? The D port, very good. So the D port, the input uh, to update you know, the register is what we need to follow. So here's the D port, we click on this wire, it's really hard to click on that wire, but we can click here, I suppose, nope. Yeah, I cannot click on the wire because it is too close to the components, but this is the wire that we are interested, oh, there we go, we can click on that. So that wire is what we are tracking. And then you go like, oh, okay, all it does is the coming, it, it's coming out of the ALU. So what do we do next? Come on, you guys know the answer. Look inside the ALU, very good. Okay, so we right click on the ALU, knowing that this is the port that we are interested in. So we right click on the ALU, <clears throat> and then view ALU. This is the flex register. The flex register is all the way down here, uh, or I should say the flex out port is all the way down here. So the way you understand you know, which port is located where on the quote unquote chip itself is to go to the appearance and then you click on a particular pin that we were looking at from the outside. And then from the picture in picture, you can now tell you know, where that port is really inside the circuit itself. So that's how you track down um, if that is the connection from the outside that we are interested in Oh, excuse me, that means the other way around. If this is the, the connection from the outside, you know, from the overall view of the processor, where is that part you know, where we look at the actual detail of the circuitry, okay? So we now know that it is all the way down there, the last, uh, the bottom most uh, output pin on the right-hand side, okay? That is where we need to go when we go back into the detail of the circuitry, which is right here. Okay, so this is the port that we saw earlier. So now you have to ask the question of, uh, looks like it's composing out of five bits, okay? Um, they are corresponding, four are corresponding to actual tunnels, and then the last one is not corresponding to any tunnel, it is computed based on two tunnels. So we have C out, okay, you know, is, going con contrib is contributing to bit zero, Z out is contributing to bit one, S out is contributing to bit two, bit, bit two, and then uh, O out is contributing to bit three, and then this thing here is contributing to bit four. So what is the next thing you're gonna do? Track down every single one of those tunnels and find out where are they coming from. I think that seems to make sense, okay? That's, maybe it's just me, okay? But it seems to make sense to track each one down, okay? So what do we do? We track them down. So we look at C out first, okay? You know, 
just one at, one at a time. So if we look at C out, when you highlight the node of C out, everything that is C out will be highlighted. So we can see how C out is really just the tunnel all the way up here, which is coming out of this multiplexer. This is a multiplexer, which means it has multiple input and one single output. So how do we know which input connects to the output in this case? It's a multiplexer. So what is the behavior of a multiplexer? How do we know which input connects to the output? The select, yeah, the select port, because it, it may not be a single bit, but you're correct, it is the select port. So the select port is the one that has a gray dot on top. And in this case, you know, we can you know, just kind of click on it and find out you know, what it is connected to, or at least the value. So the select port of the multiplexer sets 0, 0, 1. So that means input 1, which is this one here, is connected to the output here. So what do we do now? We track that one down. Okay, We track down what is you know, the tunnel B connected to. So once you highlight the node connected to the tunnel B, it will highlight every single wire and you know, tunnel that connects to it. So now we can see that the B is coming out of this thing here. And then we check out what that thing is. Okay, This is a subtractor. Okay, Look at the description here. This is a subtractor. So that means the B, the borrow flag, the borrow output flag from the subtractor becomes the carry bit, the C flag, that goes into the flags register as bit 0. Is that okay? Now, is that a lot of tracking that I that I have just done? Yes. Okay. Do I expect you to be able to do that? The answer is also a yes. Okay. So if you have any questions about how I track down all of these connections, make sure that you ask those questions as soon as you have those questions, because I am expecting you to be able to do exactly what I did. With the same efficiency or the same your know, speed? No but nonetheless, still, be a, still being able to do that. Okay, all right? So that, that deals with one particular bit. And what about the other bits? Okay, so we now try, try to track down the Z out you know, tunnel and try to find out where that thing is connected to. So we highlight you know, the wire, okay, because that really helped us to find out where it's coming from. So Z out itself is a tunnel and that tunnel is coming out of here. So Z out is coming out of here. So the question now is, um, what kind of a gate is that? It's a funky looking one, okay? But what is it? How do we read, how do we interpret from the shape of the gate and understand what it is? Now, one quick and easy way to do it is to change to the selection tool, okay? If you change to the selection tool and you click on the gate, it will actually tell you what it is. But at this point of this class, you should be able to look at the shape of the gate and be able to tell me what it is. So if it's not for the bubble, okay, you know, if you ignore the bubble here, what does it look like? What kind of a gate is it? What type of logical operation does it perform? It's an OR gate, very good. So the bubble means we are negating. So we're negating the output of a OR, which means we're just negating an OR. So what do you think is the name of that gate? It's a NOR gate, okay, N-O-R, NOR gate. Or you can just say it's a negator OR gate. Either way is fine. All right, so if this is a NOR gate, or it is the negated OR gate, what are the inputs to the NOR gate? That becomes the next question. So look at all those wires, okay? Look at all these wires going into the NOR gate. Where are they coming from? The first answer is they're coming from a splitter, right? Because you know, we have one gigantic splitter here that splits into the eight individual bits. But what is feeding into the splitter? What is, feed, what is connected to the merged end of the splitter? We go up here, it is coming out of a multiplexer. So what do you do when you track a connection back to the output of a multiplexer? Look at the select again. Very good. So we look at the select of the multiplexer, which is the which is the port right under the the gray dot, and it connects to exactly the same thing that we were looking at earlier. It has a value of 
0, 0, 1. So that means input 1 of the multiplexer is connected to the output. So what do we do next? We track down input 1 of the multiplexer, which is this Y over here. Guess what? It is coming out of the subtractor again. In other words, the result of the subtraction that we call the difference is actually connected to the output of the multiplexer. And those individual bits of the result of the subtraction, we split all eight bits into individual wires, and then each one goes into one input of this or NOR gate here. All we are doing is we're looking at the result of the subtraction and then do a OR of all those bits and then negate that result. Can someone tell me what is the one single condition, what is the one single case that this particular NOR gate will output a one? When does the NOR gate output a one? Yes. When all the inputs are zeros. Very good. So when all the inputs are zeros, only in that one single case that the output of the NOR gate is going to output a one. So that means the Z flag is going to be a one if and only if the output out of this multiplexer is a zero. And that's why it has a name of a Z flag. Can anyone guess what Z stands for? Zorro, <laughs> the character. What do you think that Z stands for? Zero, very good, okay. The Z flag stands for the zero flag. If the result of a computation is a zero, the Z flag becomes a one. Now, I should correct myself. I should have said if and only if, okay? If and only if the result of an operation of the ALU is a zero, that the Z flag becomes a one. Are we good with that observation so far? Okay, so, so far we have talked about two flags. One is called the C flag, which is really the borrow flag. The second one is the Z flag, which is going to be a one if and only if the result of the computation is a zero. Okay, <clears throat> this is this is where I would write down some notes, you know, on my notebook. Okay, you know, because you know this is really kind of important stuff. And then we look at the third one. Okay, the third one is called the S flag. Okay, it is coming uh, from a tunnel as well, so I'm highlighting it to try to figure out where that thing is coming from. So you just kind of track it down. Okay, you know these. These are all making use of the S flag or the S out your port or tunnel. But then we go all the way up here. This is where it's actually coming from. So you look at this thing here and go like, hmm, I'm not really sure what that thing is. So can someone tell me what is, how does S out, okay, as a tunnel, how does that relate to the output of this particular multiplexer here? What is the relationship? I'll give you two choices. The first one is S out is really just the output of the multiplexer. That's number one. Choice number two is S out is a particular bit of the output out of that multiplexer. So I'm gonna do the optometrist thing. Is A better or is B better? So which one is it? B. <laughs> it is one particular bit of the output. How do we know that? What is between the tunnel and the output of the multiplexer? What is between those two? It's one of the components that we have used since the beginning of this entire semester. The splitter, very good, okay. So we have a splitter in between. This is a splitter. Now I know you know, from your perspective, you may not be able to see the digit on the splitter. So we are, I am going to zoom in just so that you can see a little bit better you know, what digit is on the splitter itself. What is the digit? Now this part really is like the opt optometrist you know, test because you know, it's a little bit small on the screen. What is it? Seven. It says seven, right? So that means bit seven 
of the output of the multiplexer becomes as out the tunnel. What is so significant about bit 7 of an A bit number? It's the sign bit. Very good. And therefore, the letter S, right? It is the sign bit. So that means the sign bit has, is its own flag as the output. So when you look at the output for the flags in the port, the sign bit is bit 2. It is its own little flag. It has its own little place. OK, so that is all good. What about O out? OK, let's check out O out now. So now we go back to the <clears throat> poking tool. We look at O out, and we highlight the entire thing. And you can see that O out is coming out of this particular multiplexer. So once again, if you're looking at the output of a multiplexer, you look at the selection, the, the select port, to find out where it's coming from. It's coming from input 1. This is input 1. And then you go to, you know, you track down what is input 1. This is an OR. This is S1. Um, this is not S1 and S2 and S out or S1 and not S2 and S out. Okay? So you go like, um, well, we know what is S out. Okay? S out is the sign bit of the output of the whole operation. But we have not really kind of talked about what is S1 versus S2. So what do we do now? We, tra we track those down. Okay? So that means you know, to understand the ALU is a lot of tracking. Okay? There's a lot of stuff that you need to track down. <clears throat> so we look at S1 first, okay? So we highlight it, and then we try to track down, okay, where is that coming from? Oh, right here. It's coming from here. And what do you think S1 is representing? Looks like a very similar setup, you know, because it, it looks like it is going, it is the, it's the split end of a splitter. It is only bit 7, but it's the bit 7 of in 1. Okay. Where's in one going to? So you look at the, the multiplexer here, and then you look at the select port here. So now you can see that in one is going to output one. Oh, it's going to the subtractor. In one is going to the one of the input of the subtractor. The top port of the subtractor is the minuend. Minuend is corresponding to our x in binary subtraction. Okay. So that means S1 is really just the sign bit of the minuen, or from our perspective, it is the sign bit of X. Is that okay? And S out is really the sign bit of the difference, which is our D7. I mean, yeah, that's our D7. So this is D7, okay? The sign bit, sign out is D7, and then S1, is x7 using our binary subtraction nomenclature. What about s2? It's right here, okay? s2 is right here. It is also bit 7 of in2. But where is in2 going? What is, what is the purpose of in2? It's going through this demultiplexer to connect to something else. So we track down the demultiplexer, and the way we do it is we look at, you know, this one is obvious because you know, the actual port connected to the select port here is, is visible. So we now know that the input of this multi D multiplexer connects to output 1. And guess what? It's going into the second input port of the subtractor, which is the subtrahend of the subtraction. That becomes our Y. So that means S2 is really the same thing as Y7 in our you know, nomenclature for this class. And S1 is really the same thing as X7, or bit 7 of X. And then once again, you know, S out is bit 7 of the difference, or our D7. Okay. Do you recall a discussion that involves that involved the most significant bits of X, Y, and the difference? What was the context of that discussion? Hmm? 
the overflow there. Very good. Okay. So that's how that these are the ingredients that we need to compute the overflow flag. So then we go to the um, the whole circuitry again, do the overflow flag, you know, calculation. Specifically, we look at this subcircuit here. Okay, this little subcircuit here. Do you recognize? Okay, if I tell you that this really is X7, this really is Y7, and this really is D7, do you recognize this is actually the logical expression to compute the overflow? Okay, let me switch to the notes here so that you can kind of, you know where it's coming from. Okay, so we will go back to the notes here, and this is about um, comparison. don't have oh because I have hidden the uh, the entire module over here so we have to go back to physical states gates and numbers then we scroll down and go find binary subtraction which is down here somewhere and this is about comparison so we probably want to look at comparison so when we get to the comparison module then we go to the old flag, which is part of the signed less than deal discussion. And right here, this is what we are talking about. Somebody will look at this equation and go like, I have no idea what we are talking about here. M is the number of bits, okay? So in our case, what do you think M is according to the toy processor architecture? How wide what is the width of the numbers that we're dealing with? M is 8 bit. Okay, very good. So M is 8, which means we are looking at X7 and not Y7 and not D7 or not X7 and Y7 and D7. Is that right? Okay. So try to remember that. Try to Okay, I'll, I'll do better than that. So I'm going to use my screenshot tool, which is actually an excellent tool for something like this. So I'm going to take a tiny little screenshot here. And I'm going to open up you know, the screenshot in its own tiny little viewer and make it always on top. So this way, when I switch back to um, Logisim, we'll still have this equation displayed. So now we switch back to um, Logisim. And I'm just going to stash it over here. And I will even use a text tool here. I'm not going to save this file, but I'm going to just do it here. See if I, no, it won't let me do it because we're in a view only mode. Okay, but that's okay. S1 is X7, S2 is Y7, and then S out is D7. Do you see how the equation, this equation here, is now represented by the circuitry over here? more or less okay if you're not a hundred percent sure it's okay you can check this out after the class okay so you can actually look into the detail and convince yourself after the class but what i'm trying to say is oh this here is really just this wire okay let me go back to the poking tool <clears throat> so this wire is really the overflow flag it's not surprising that it is called the O out, overflow output. Is that okay? All right. So I know that you may not remember the whole discussion of binary number comparison. That's okay. You have time to review. That is why for every hour of lecture, you are supposed to schedule two additional hours outside of the class time to study the material. Okay, so use that time to remake that connection between the circuitry here and our discussion of the overflow flag. Okay, so what is the bottom line here? We have explained four out of the five flags coming out of the flags output port. So I can close, I can close this now. And then we have this one here that has no name. But what is this particular gate here? What does that look like here? Exclusive OR. Okay, but what is what is it doing the exclusive OR of? Is the input into the exclusive OR gate? 
is the sine and the overflow. What is the significance of the exclusive OR between the sine and the overflow? Okay, first of all, it has its own name when we talk about it in binary comparison. Yep. It is the L flag. Okay, very good. So what is the significance of the L flag? The L flag is a one if and only if. Okay, let's let's go back to this to the to this to the module, okay? So the overflow flag is a one if and only if the sign interpretation of the bit pattern X is less than the sign interpretation of the bit pattern Y. Okay? So this may be something that you want to write down, okay? You know, because this is going to be useful for the rest of this semester. Because we'll be implementing C code, and every time we have a comparison, you kind of have to first ask the question, are we comparing signed numbers, or are we comparing unsigned numbers? If we're comparing signed numbers, which flag is useful? If you're comparing unsigned numbers, which flag is useful? So that is the relationship between, between what we are doing now and something that we have done weeks ago, okay? So what you probably want to write down is not the whole thing that I just talked about because the whole lecture is still being recorded, the, the screen is good, the audio is good. What you do want to write down is refer back to the binary comparison discussion. And then review that, okay, you know, after class, over the weekend, okay? But that is something that you have to do because I don't have the time. We don't have the time to revisit that particular discussion. It's already done. Is that okay? Okay, so I'm not counting on you knowing in details, you know, how all of these are supposed to be connected, but I am relying on you to study and review the content so that we, you can remake you can, you can reconnect between those concepts, okay? So that's something that you're gonna have to do. Okay, so switching back to the circuit. So that means out of these five bits, okay? These are the things other than the Z flag, which we really haven't talked about. This is the borrow flag. C out is actually the borrow flag, which is occupying bit zero. Bit one is the new thing, which is the Z flag. The Z flag is a one if and only if. <clears throat> Um, the output of the operation is a zero. Um, the third bit is the sign flag, which means if the difference is um, negative, then the bit two is going to be a one. And then the fourth bit or bit three is the overflow flag, which means you know, if the subtraction, if the difference of the subtraction has a sign that does not make sense, then the overflow flag is going to be a one. And then the last one is the L flag which means when the minuend is less than the subtrahend in signed interpretation, then bit four is going to be a one. All right, so right now, just based on what you see on the screen here, what is it telling us? The borrow flag is a one. What is the significance of the borrow flag being a one in a comparison? So, okay, it's okay not to remember because it has been a while. But where do you go look in, to find out what is the significance of the borrow flag or the borrow flag of the last bit after a binary comparison? Which module would you go back to? Comparison, okay? So all of these are coming out of the comparison discussion. So when you go back to the comparison from one, and then you go all the way back to section three, okay? So remember in section three, I said one thing, it's like, oh, the rest is really approved, only the first paragraph, which is a single sentence paragraph, is really important. What is that telling you? In a binary subtraction of two m bit patterns, x minus y, t of m, is the B flag, okay? T of M is the B flag. It is a one if and only if the unsigned interpretation of X is less than the unsigned interpretation of Y, okay? That is the significance. In other words, if in the circuit here, this thing being a one means 
whatever is feeding in one is actually less than whatever is feeding uh, into using the unsigned interpretation. That is what the light green is signifying. Is that okay? Well, it's okay for you guys not to be convinced because then we're gonna to go to the actual input and take a look. So we go to the input and really take a look. What is the unsigned interpretation of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0? What is the value it is representing unsigned? 0, okay, not really surprising, right? Because it's all zeros. What about uh, the other one? What about 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1? As an 8-bit number, what is the unsigned interpretation of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1? I mentioned that earlier in class, right? Because you know it is just one plus two plus four plus eight plus sixteen plus thirty-two plus sixty-four plus one six one hundred twenty-eight. Whatever that is, is probably be greater than zero. Yep. It is two hundred fifty-five. So the question is: Is zero less than two hundred fifty-five? What do you think? Yes. Okay. So that's why the overall borrow, which is this right here, this is our T8, okay? It is equivalent to our T8 in the discussion of binary subtraction. So there's a big connection between what we are talking about now versus what we have talked about a long time ago, okay? It started off with binary subtraction, moving on to the signed versus the unsigned interpretation, then moving on to the binary comparison discussion. Those three modules are now suddenly become significant again. Okay, so you might want to spend some time to review those particular modules that we have talked about kind of a long time ago. I would say about five weeks ago or so, something like that. Okay, are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So what we can do is we can play with stuff now, okay? So we can go back to the register bank and say, well, what if we compare two things that have exactly the same value? Okay, so we make register A and register D the same thing. So we can just make this one, I don't know, you know, 72 in hexadecimal. Also make this one 72 in hexadecimal. And then we can go back to the ALU into it and then we go all the way to the flags again, and then find out what are the output at this point for the flags. So according to this, um, in one is, is not less than in two unsigned. That makes sense because they're the same number. Um, the difference does not have, it's not negative. That makes sense because they're really the same number. Uh, there's no overflow. That makes sense because when you subtract a number from itself, it's not going to cause an overflow. There's no way that can cause an overflow. So, but the Z flag is a one. Why? Because the result is a zero. So when you look at zero as an A-bit number, and you take every single bit out of the A-bit number, feed all of those into an eight input NOR gate, then the output is going to be a one because you have zero or zero or zero and a whole bunch of four zeros. That's going to be a zero. But then you negate it, becomes a one. So that's why the only flag that is a one is the Z flag here. Okay? So let me ask another question. Can we make the sign flag being a one? Okay, in other words, can I set up register A and register D so that the sign flag here is going to be a one? Yeah, pretty easy. Negative one minus zero is negative one. And negative one should have the sign flag being a one because that's the whole thing about the sign flag is if the value being represented is negative, the sign flag is going to be a one. Okay, so now we go back to main. We go back to the registers. Okay, so we'll go up to the register bank over here. And then we change the registers. So the register A is the one that is FF. And then register D is the one that is 0, 0. Then we go back to the ALU. <clears throat> and then we, oh, okay, right click, view ALU. 
And then we go all the way back to the flags you know, at the bottom to find out what is going on here. And we can see that this time the sign flag is a one, but the borrow flag is not, okay? The borrow flag is a zero because from the perspective of unsigned integers, FF is 255. 255 minus zero does not have a borrow. You do not need to borrow because 255 is greater than or equal to zero, and that's why the borrow flag is a zero. So this is the kind of exercise that you can do while the processor is pulsed, okay? Because I'm not clocking, right? You know, I'm not doing control T, so that means the connection between the register bank and the ALU stays the same this entire time. I can go back and change the registers any way I want, then they come back to the ALU and re-examine how the flags are going to be computed. Okay, this is one thing that you might want to write down so that you can do the same kind of experiment on your own. Okay, you're doing just you're experimenting with the compare instruction. All right, so I know this is a lot of discussion. I know this is a little bit difficult because you're going to have to recall something that you learned weeks ago. Okay. So I'm not expecting everybody to go like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. That is not what I'm expecting. What I am expecting is you faintly recall that we have talked about some of these things before. The details, you might have forgotten. That's fine. Second thing, I'm expecting you to know where to find all of that information that we have talked about already. And the third expectation is I'm expecting you guys to spend some time to go back and review those particular topics. Okay, so you can jot down some notes to yourself and go like, okay, I need to go back and revisit some of these topics that we have talked about in the past. All right, so I'm going to take a short break here. I'm going to go ahead and take roll. Okay. <clears throat> So right here we have row ticking activity for today, which is 2023, 10, 26. Okay. And let me make it visible to you. And then I'll show you what. So the access code is OTA because the previous one is T-O-Y. So together they spell Toyota. I'm pretty sure you have seen those trucks, you know, the, the pickup trucks, you know, some would kind of paint over the OTA, so it's just toy, same idea. And no, I do not drive a Toyota. I used to. Yeah, I think we got enough time to do it. We have until 10 a.m. to type in OTA and then just you know, answer the question of you know, whether you're in class today or not. <clears throat> all right, so I'm assuming we are all good with the road taking activity. So now we move on to the other two instructions that we are supposed to be talking about today. The first one is the JMPI instruction. So we go back to the opcode table to take a look at the JMPI instruction, which is not the JMP instruction. There is a JMP instruction. It has its own use, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today. What we'll be talking about today is the JMPI instruction, which is on row 9. So the JMPI instruction does not use any registers because you can see that the, the uh, the opcode does not have a field for xx nor yy, but it is it uses an immediate value. So that means you know we are expecting an a bit number after the opcode. The opcode is going to be a four zero, okay? So it's going to be the opcode of four zero followed by an a bit number. How do we use that a bit number? The a bit number is going to be where the program counter is pointing to. We just take whatever content is at the location that the program counter is pointing to and then use that to update the program counter itself. Okay? So that's what the JMPI instruction is really doing. 
Okay. So the question is, um, what does it look like when we execute instructions like that? So that's what we're going to do next. So what we'll do is we're switching back to the processor. I'm going to reset simulation because you know, we are now going to experiment with a new program here. And this particular program is going to have a JMPI instruction to a specific location. So 4.0 is the opcode of JMPI. The next byte is going to specify where do we want to go to, okay? Um, we can make it somewhat arbitrary. We can say, oh, let's go to location 08, okay? So we put a 08 over here. And then at location 08, we probably want to put a 01 here as a halt instruction. So this way, by the time we get to location 08, the execution of the program will basically come to a halt. Okay, but I don't think we'll even go there. Okay, we'll even get that far because I will just kind of decode the JMPI opcode itself and then we'll take a look at the connection between the components in the processor just to understand how the JMPI instruction is getting the job done. All right, so now we are ready to do it because I just reset the whole processor. And the first thing we do is we go to the controller part of the processor. And then we just you know, go through the fetch and then get through the decode phase of execute, executing an instruction. And then we pause and then we take a look at all the connectivity between the components of the processor. So it takes four edges to get, to, to get through the decode phase of executing an instruction. So here we go. One, two, three, four. There we go. Okay. So we can see the microcode pointer is 400, which is the opcode with an extra zero on the right hand side. The content at location 400 in ROM is now specifying the pathway between the components in the processor. So now we go back to the main part of the processor and try to analyze what is going on here. And you can see that this time RAM is in use. Okay, we are actually using RAM. We are reading because LD is a one. And now we want to track down a, the A port as well as the D port. We first track down the A port. That's my preference. You don't have to follow that particular order. The A port is coming out of the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of one, which means we now track down the input one of the multiplexer. It's coming out of the program counter. In other words, the program counter now connects to RAM.A or the A port of RAM, which means the program counter is telling us what location in RAM we should be reading. That answers one part of the question. The second part of the question is who is, pay, who is paying attention to that content at that location? So this time we track down the D port. The D port, once again, goes to a whole bunch of places, but no one is updating except for the program counter itself, because the program counter has a light green going into the enable port, which means the program counter is going to be updated. Okay, so if it is going to be updated, we follow the D port. It's coming out of a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of one, so that means we have to track down input one of the multiplexer, which is the output of another multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of one, which means we now track down the input one of this particular multi multiplexer, and guess what? It does connect all the way back to the D port of RAM. So that means we are using the content of the location in RAM that the program counter is pointing to to update the program counter itself. Okay, I'm just gonna pause here to see if there are any questions. questions okay so before I do another rising edge okay let's see what we are going to expect okay what are we expecting the program counter to update to so all we have to do is to click on this particular wire and it is an 8 or in binary 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. so that means when I click on you know when I type control T on the keyboard to give us you know a rising edge the program counter will update to 08. Okay, so here we go. Control T, bing. 
So now the, the program counter is at uh, 0, 08. And then we're going to go back to the microcode pointer. So when I have a falling edge, in this case, the microcode pointer will uh, increment to location 401, which is basically two followed by six zeros, which is which means the effect is changing the microcode pointer back to zero. So here's control T. So now we are back to the fetch phase of executing an instruction. And where do you think we are going to find the next opcode? Where in RAM am I going to find the next opcode? Okay, can you remember what is the value of the program counter at this point? We just updated it. What did we update it to? You cannot see it from the screen. I'm testing to see if you paid attention and remember how we updated the program counter. Okay, so if you cannot remember, that's okay. We can, I can show it. <clears throat> it's 0, 08. So if the program counter is now at 0, 08, and we are back to the fetch phase of executing, executing an instruction, where am I getting the next opcode in RAM? At location 0, 08. Not zero 09, but zero 08, okay? So we are now you know, getting the next opcode from location zero 08. And we can tell that too, because we can see how location zero 08 is highlighted in RAM. We are reading, and we are now back to, remember, we are back to the fetch phase of execu executing an instruction. So that zero 01 at location zero 08 is going to be stored in the, in the instruction register, because we are, we are back to the beginning of executing an instruction. It's just that after executing the JMPI instruction at location 00, now we are continuing to execute at location 08. And that's why the mnemonic of this particular instruction is JMP, because it's jumping to a certain location to continue execution. Is that OK? All right. So this is one way for us to alter the path of execution. But it's not conditional. So every single time you get to the JMPI instruction, it will continue execution based on the, the byte following the opcode. So it's going to go to the same location. This is a perfect way to set up an infinite loop, but it's not useful for a conditional statement because it always goes to the same location to continue execution. Do we have any questions at this point about the JMPI instruction? <clears throat> because the next one depends on the understanding of the JMPI instruction combined with what we already know about the flags register. Are we still doing okay or not? All right, well, I'm going to finish this up, okay, and then we'll talk about, you know, how we combine the use of those instructions. So the next instruction we'll be talking about, according to the opcode table, is a conditional branch instruction. There are five conditional branch instructions. These are, each one is a conditional branch instruction. JLI means you know, branch or jump if and only if the L flag is a one, okay? JOI. It's not joy, it is branch if and only if the O flag is a one. JSI, you probably guessed that one, branch or jump if the sign flag, if and only if the sign flag is a one. JCI, branch if the C flag, which is also the borrow flag, is a one. And then JZI is branch if the Z flag is a one. So now we have these five conditional branch instructions. The opcode is kind of like this over here, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is a 4, and then this is a 1, this is a 2, 3, and this is a 4, and this is a 5. So 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, and 4, 5 correspond to the JMPI, the conditional branch instructions. Okay, so how does it get a job done? Okay, that's the next question. 
The way it gets the job done is explained by the ternary operator here. If the L flag is a one, is true, then we use whatever the program count is pointing to to update the program counter. If the L flag is a zero, then we only increment the program counter, you know, that becomes the whatever is the following location in red. So that's the actual implementation of the conditional branch instruction. So you look at the description here, you go like, hmm, that's pretty abstract, you know, it's pretty difficult to, to visualize. So what we'll do next is we're actually going to write some code, okay, and then we'll experiment with one of these you know, conditional branch instructions. So are we good with that? Okay, all right. So of all of these, I'm just going to play with the JCI instruction, you know, because the C flag is the is bit zero of the flags register. I can just kind of plant a zero or one very easily into the flags register. So we can see the effect of what makes it conditional. So JCI has an opcode of four four. Okay, so we switch back to the um, logic sim, control R to reset the entire thing. So RAM is now cleared out. So now we have 44 as an opcode. I'm just going to keep you know, 08 as the destination. So we put 08 here. And then at location 08, we put a 01. And we are going to also put a 01 here. Because if the C flag is a 0, it will continue execution at where the 01, the, the highlighted one is at this point. Okay? So this is where you know, things can get a little bit you know, tricky because we are looking at two possibility. One is to do the branch and the other one is not to do the branch. So we do the usual thing, okay? We are going to do the fetch and just get through the decode cycle without executing. So that means four control T's, one, two, three, four. And we can see that, you know, we are now at location 440 or 440, I should say, of the ROM. And the, these bits are now specifying what the processor should do. So now we go back here. The first thing we need to do is to look at the flags register. Do you think bit zero of the flags register is a one or a zero at this point? Do you need to know about binary comparison or binary conversion to see whether bit zero of the flags register is a zero or one? The entire flags register is zero. None of the bits of flags should be a one. So that means the carry flag, the C flag, should be a zero right now. So tell me again, if the C flag is a zero, what should we do to the program counter? Okay, yep. It should increment by one. Okay, so we're going to take a look at you know, the program counter and see whether it is going to increment by one. So here's the program counter. It is enabled, which means it's going to update. The question is, how is it going to update? So we look at the uh, D port. We track it down. The PC mug says you know, it is a dark green, which is you know, using input 0 of the multiplexer. Input 0 of the multiplexer connects to the output of the adder. The adder has uh, the carry in being a 1, which means you know, it's just adding 1 to the program counter. So a 0, 2 is over here, and the 0, 2 is going to be used to update the program counter. So that explains in the ternary expression. Okay, let me switch back to the opcode discussion here. So that explains this portion here. Is that okay? Because currently the C flag is a 0. The program counter is only going to increment which means it's basically pretending that there's no jump instruction. I'm just going to go to the next part, the following instruction to continue execution. I'm not going to branch to some other location. Is that okay? So <clears throat> going back to the processor, I can now go, I, I'm going to inject, you know, um, a value of zero, 01 into the flax register. So a zero one as in hexadecimal is zero 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 one, which means bit zero is a one at this point, and the instruction is paying attention to bit zero of the flags register. 
So now we look at the PC, the program counter again, and we ask, okay, how are you going to update yourself? Because it is still going to be updated. Now, remember, I did not do a rising edge, and that's why the program counter is not updated yet, because I did not do a control T. So the, as far as the processor is concerned, it is frozen in its current state. Okay, I'm just playing with your know, different values when the connections are staying exactly the same way. So this time you can see how PC MUX becomes a one. Now, why is it a one? We'll talk about that later, okay? But when PC MUX is a one, it is going to select input one to connect to the output. And this in return is the output of another multiplexer, which also has a select of one, which then we track down this connection. And that connection goes all the way back to the D port of RAM. RAM is being read because LD is a one. And then we track down you know, the A port it goes back to the output of this multiplexer, which has a select of one. So we look at the input one of this multiplexer, which goes all the way back to the program counter itself. In other words, this looks exactly like a JMPI instruction because we are using the D port of RAM to update the program counter itself. Is that okay? All right, does everybody see the two scenarios when the C flag or the or bit zero of the flags register is a zero, which was the demonstration before this one, versus where the flags register has bit zero being a one, which is what we are dealing with right now. Can we see the two scenarios, okay? So the magical part, okay, of how this is happening has to do with PC mugs. So if you look at PC mugs, which is you know, this tunnel here, it became a one in this case, but it was a zero before. So the question now is, how does it know when to become a zero and when to become a one? PC mugs does not come from the ROM directly. PC mugs is actually the output of this particular multiplexer. So you look at PC mugs here, it is the output of this multiplexer. So what do you do next? You track down what is the input that connects to this output. So PC mux mux, okay, because it is a multiplexer of a multiplexer. So PC mux mux has a, has a value of zero, zero, zero. So that means input zero of this multiplexer connects to the output. So now we track down who is input zero of this multiplexer. This is input zero of the multiplexer. Where is it going to? You can see there's a splitter here, okay? That splitter goes all the way back to the output of the flags register. That is how the processor knows to use bit zero of the flags register through the multiplexer, which selects which one of the five bits of the flags register to connect to the PC mux. PC mux in return goes all the way down here to help us decide are we incrementing the program counter or are we going to use the output of RAM to update the program counter? That is how the conditional branch instruction is implemented inside the processor. Are we good so far or not? Let me take a look at the time. We got seven more minutes. There's plenty of time. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll give you a pictorial kind of representation of the conditional branch instruction because, because what we just talked about describe how it is done. For the most part, okay, when you're writing code, you're more concerned about what is it doing, not so much how it is getting it done. Now, exam two is going to focus on how things are done. So that means you still need to be familiarized with how things are done inside the processor but after exam two, we are much more focused on what is being done instead of how it is being done. So in terms of what is being done, the best way to do this is to use my tablet because it, I can use a flowchart to represent to you what we want to talk about. So I'm going to start up the uh, scrcby.sh. <clears throat> And then move that into view over here. There we go. All right. 
So I'm just going to write some instruction here. Okay, we'll have a. Um, okay, just for the sake of this, you know, it's no op, no op, J C I to a label L1, and then the halt instruction here at label L1. We have another halt instruction here. So this is just a sample program. It does not even have a compare. Okay. So I'm not really concerned about, you know, how do we set the carry flag because there's no compare instruction here to set the carry flag. I just want to look at the flow chart. Okay, that's all I want to do is to look at the flow chart of this thing. So the no ops is really just a block of code doing absolutely nothing. Okay. The JCI instruction is a branch. So it is asking, is the carry flag a one or not? Is it non-zero? Okay. If it is non-zero, okay, this is you know, when the answer is yes, this is when the answer is no, then we have this halt instruction, okay, the, the first one, okay, this halt is this halt here. Otherwise, it branches to label L1 to the other halt instruction here. So is that helping to illustrate you know, what a conditional branch is? The JCI is the diamond. Okay, it is asking, is the carry is the carry flag not equal to zero? If it is not zero, meaning it's, if it's one, then it performs the actual branch to whatever L1 is. Remember, L1 is a label. It is just a bookmark of a location. In this case, it's the bookmark of the second halt instruction. What if the carry flag is a zero? Well, if the carry flag is a zero, then it's not performing the branch. It would just go to whatever is sequentially following the JCI instruction. It's just not branch. It's not branching. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So that's just one more thing that I need to talk about today. It's more of a re-demonstration of something that I have done before. So when we're dealing with a program that we are talking about today, you know, in the lab, it is going to be a piece of code that you have to track through in terms of the execution. So one way to track through the execution of the code, so I'm, I'm writing the code first, okay? So I'm going to go to the temp folder and just write some code. Uh, we'll just say cond.ttpasm, conditional. So in this one, we're going to load uh, register A to be FF, which is 255, LDI B or D, okay, we'll keep using register A and D to be uh, zero in this case, CMP AD, which is the opcode that we first took a look at today, at first, uh, at the beginning of the class. And then we're going to do a J, uh, let's see, this one, we can do a JCI, of course. So we can do a JCI to label L1. L1 is defined here. We have a halt instruction here, and then we have another halt instruction here. So let's just say this is the program we want to track through. Now this time, you know, because I'm using the command line way of executing a program, so a no op instruction is mandatory as the first opcode. So whenever we use the command line mode of executing a program in Logisim, you have to start with a no op instruction. So this is the program that we want to track through. <clears throat> so what we need to do is to send this program to the assembler, assemble it, get the code back, and then we run the program in Logisim using the command line tool or the, the, the command line option. Now, before we do that, which halt do you think we're going to end up at? Are we going to end up at the halt at line six, or do you think we should end up with the halt instruction on line eight? What do you think? Register A is initialized to FF or 1111111. Register D is initialized to 0, which is 0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. So when you subtract 0000, 000, 000 from 1111111, do you think the borrow flag is going to be set or not? It is not going to be set, okay? So the carry flag is cleared. So if the carry flag is cleared, 
are we going to label L1 or are we not going to label L1? We are not going to label L1, which means execution will fall through the JCI instruction. So we end up at the home instruction on line six. Okay, so that's the expected behavior of this program. So I'm going to save this code here. Okay, so the first thing I will do is to do the super shortcut way of doing this. Okay, so I'm going to my <clears throat> um, folder called uh, Reaper Spider. Okay, so Reaper, oh, this one folder up, I guess. There we go. And all I have to do is to say submit, and then the actual location of the source code, which is in my temp folder, is called uh, cond.ttpasm. So this is the really shortcutted way of doing this. Then I'll show you how to do it in a not so shortcutted way because not everybody has already you know configured to use um, this particular tool. So now everything is done, and I can go now go back to the browser. Uh, browser, there we go. Go back to the assembler. Oh, this one over here, and. Then we go to the analysis tab. So this is how you can track down the execution of the program. We started off on line one, which is the no-op instruction. Then we go to line two, which put 255 or FF into register A. Then we go to line three, which put a zero into register D. So register D became zero, even though it's already zero, but you know, we're putting an extra zero into there. Then we perform the compare instruction the result of the compare instruction is only to set the L flag to become a one, also the sign flag to become a one, but we only care about the carry flag because we have a JCI instruction. It doesn't care about the L, the O, or the S flag. So we have a JCI instruction. Then the JCI instruction is going to continue execution on line eight, which I'm not sure why it doesn't tell us it is on, um, it goes to location eight but it doesn't tell us that this is actually on line six, okay, the whole construction of line six. But this is how we can track down the entire path of executing this program. So some of you may be asking, okay, can you show me the code when it actually does tick the branch because the carry flag is a one? We can do that. So we go back to the program. <clears throat> and then we change the way we compare. So we just have to flip the zero and the 255 because this time we are subtracting 1111 from 0000. zero, zero, zero. So 1111 is a larger number unsigned compared to 0000. zero, 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 zero. So that means you know, the carry flag will indeed be set this time. So now I rerun the program. And this is why I really like this tool because you know, I just run the program again even though it's not instantaneous, you know, I don't have to do a whole lot of work on my own to get it to work. So we go back to the browser. And this time you can also see, you know, how the carry flag is a one, but we continue execution on at location zero nine, which is the second home construction. So this is one way to kind of track down the execution of a program. Okay. But some of, some people will say, but I don't know how to do this. You know, I don't have your reverse spider setup. That's okay. So if you don't have reverse spider setup, you go to the RAM file, then you have to kind of do it the long way. You go here, you download the CSV, you know, of the RAM file. You have to remember where you put it. So I'm just going to call this cond.csv. So I'm going to replace that. Okay. And then I can close the GUI version of the processor. Then I go back to the command line, but this time I have to run um, Logisim on the command line with all the tracing turned on. So that is java-jar on my computer. Where do I find CI, um, Logisim 310? So to me, this is a really kind of long folder or long path name. Um, if you put everything into the same folder, you know, that can make things a whole lot easier. So this is how I start up Logisim. But to start up Logisim is not going to be helpful. I have to also to start up with the processor circuit. So now I have another long path to specify the processor circuit. There we go. 
So if I press the enter key, now it's going to start the logic scene with the processor circuit. Okay. So I know it is the the characters are kind of small. So what I do is I'm going to magnify the text a little bit. So this way it's easier for you guys to kind of read the whole command. There we go. Oops. Nope. Control Shift Plus. There we go. Okay. I think that's a little better. All right. So now we have to load the RAM content, which is dash load, and then we have to specify the path to the CSV file, which is cond.csv. Then we have to say run it on the command line, which means we have to specify dash tty and then table. If you press the enter key right now, it's going to generate the, the log, but it will send it to standard output, which means you, know, you just see a whole bunch of zeros and ones on the console, which is not super helpful. So you want to redirect that to con.tsv. However you want to name this file is fine, okay? It doesn't really care. But I just choose TSV, which stands for tab separated value. You press the enter key. Now everything is saved to the file that we call con.tsv. I probably want to put it into the temp folder too, so let me just do that. Okay, so now everything is now captured in that file. Now what you do is you go back to the browser you go to trace raw data, go back to this tab here, and then you go to file, import, upload, and then you go to con.tsv, not csv, have it uploaded, and now you have to be very careful you know, to select replace current sheet, use tab only as a separator type, and turn off convert text to numbers, dates, and formulae, and then press import data. So what that's going to do is it's going to import all the zeros and ones that we captured earlier when I ran Logisim on the command line. This is not going to be helpful to you, but if you go back to the analysis tab, it will give you something like what we saw earlier, except this one is a little bit more spaced out, okay? but it still works. So this is the other way, this is the long way of tracking the execution of your program. But the only way to do this, you still cannot avoid the use of the command line interface. Which is one of the reasons why I kind of pushed you guys earlier, as in week one, to use the command line way of running Logisim to capture the log output, because you know this, we, we are now at a point where this is inevitable. You have to do it this way. All right, so this is something that you kind of need to do for the lab for today. Um, and that's about it. I think I covered everything that you need to know for, you know, in order for you to do the lab. Are there any questions? No questions, okay. So if there are no questions, I will go ahead and show you the lab. You'll make it visible and also give you the key to get started. All right, so I can, I can hide this part again because I don't need it. So the lab today is called Simple Branching and Code Analysis. And I forgot to change the date, so I have to do that first. So it's visible to you, but you cannot get in yet because I have not reset the uh, date for the lab. I'm going to change this part first. Today is October 26. And I need to specify the time. It is for this class, it is 11.50 a.m. And same thing here, October 26. 11.50 a.m. There we go. Save. And it is published. So you should be able to get in, and then the access code is JOY, J-O-Y. Not J-O-I, J-O-Y in this case. <clears throat>
So as a quick reminder, I do have office hours today right before class. Okay, that's one, one hour that I usually will be in my office before class. So if, you're, if you need to ask questions about the material, because you know, we are really kind of picking up the pace at this point, um, make use of my office hour. Come to my office hour and ask questions if you want to. All right, with that all said and done, I'm going to turn off the recorder.